My name is Mary Rice and I'm the Assistant Director here of Alumni Career Services. We are going to get started. Um, we have heard that traffic is, is rather bad, so there may be some people trickling in, but we would like to respect your time as well. Um, we're very happy to have you here for this um, starting up your career. Is entrepreneurship a viable option for you? And um, this is part of Career Month and it's a series of 10 different events going on globally. So we're very excited to have you here. I'd like to thank the organizers of the event for all their hard work that made this possible, especially Amy Gardner, Vincent Choi, Lisa Johnson, Barbara Andrews, Carolyn Metnick. And a special thanks as well to the panelists um, who will be introduced shortly. Unfortunately, um, a few of them came down with the flu, so um, we would especially like to thank Dorote for um, filling in last minute. For those of you who um, have not contacted us in terms of career services, there are quite a few services that are available to you as alumni, and we definitely like you to, um, to come up and, and talk to us about them if you're interested, different networking um, tools and career resources. Um, and now I'd like to introduce the president of the Alumni Club here in Chicago, Amy Gardner. And what Mary didn't mention is that she and Matt Donato from uh, Career Services actually organized a lot of this event along with Vincent and the others that she mentioned. Um, I'm a 2002 graduate of law school and a litigation partner at Ungardian and Harris. Um, I just want to thank you all for coming. Uh, the, you probably all get the brochure in the mail, hopefully, um, that shows you other events that the Alumni Club organizes. Um, other events that we have coming up are a November 14th Hyde Park Food Pantry Volunteer Day. Um, and if you go to the um, UFC website and then go to alumni and then search for events in Illinois, don't search on Chicago, it doesn't work. Search on Illinois, then you'll see um, that you can sign up for that event and others. Uh, we also have a November 20th lunch um, with a panel talking about the current Supreme Court term. And it's a panel of um, people who practice in front of the Supreme Court as well as professors from the law school. Um, and if you're an attorney, uh, we're going to be able to offer a free CLE for that program. So um, sign up if you're interested. And then this winter, um, we did a big program last year on job hunting and realized that there was a lot of interest. So this winter, we're going to have four programs, four weeks in a row in January and February. Um, one on interpersonal communication skills, which will be helpful for people searching for jobs as well as people wanting to advance in their jobs. Um, a program on networking, an advanced program on resumes, and um, a program on maintaining a positive attitude during a job search. So look for the opportunity to sign up for those. If you want to get involved in helping plan volunteer or um, activities or programs, please talk to um, Lisa Johnson, who I just saw. Oh, sorry, Lisa Johnson from our board who's here, or um, Vincent, or you can talk to me afterwards. We'd love to have you get involved in the Alumni Club. Uh, finally, I'll turn it over to Vincent Choi. Um, Vincent is a consultant with Chicago Partners, which is a subsidiary of Navigant Consulting where he focuses on issues with antitrust, uh, labor discrimination, and financial damages. He's also the co-founder and former creative director of AvantGaudi.com, an online retailer that focuses on vintage fashion and cutting edge trends. He holds a BA in music from the university, and while he was there, he had um, responsibilities with concert booking, WHPK's classical music format, and student government. Uh, he is the current co-chair for pro the programming committee of the board of the Alumni Club. So um, with that, I'll turn it over to Vincent and our panel. Thank you. Why I am talking into a microphone, we are recording this and it's going to be broadcasted online for other people to watch. And um, we have a very intimate event. If you want to come down and sit closer, you're very welcome to do so. And uh, in the meanwhile, I just want to introduce you briefly to our panelists. And so sitting right here, we have um, Jamie Stevens, who is the partner of Loberg Stevens, and he has a bachelor's degree from 2004. And Dorte Rowe Hedinger, right next to him, is the creator, co-producer, and host of OrganicNation.tv. And she graduated with a BA in 2007. Next to, next to her is um, David Chung, who is the founder of iWish and um, also from Fantasia Fresh Juice. And next to him is Mr. Charles Stevens, who has a master's from 1991 and is the co-founder of Bill Ops Design. And finally, we have uh, Mr. Andrew Cleborn, 
who graduated with his undergrad in 1983, and he's the partner and co-founder of Elmer Stahl, Clever and Solberg. And so before we start, I just want to get a sense of, of the crowd that we have here. How many of you have already started your business? Raise up your hand. And how many of you are thinking of starting your business? Raise up your hand. Great. And so, and so we have a sense of, of what we're talking about. So we're going to focus primarily on the process of getting to your business being started and solidified with a foundation. And there are lots of interesting parts. I'll ask just two quick questions, and then I'll open up the rest of the event for your questions. And so first of all, I would like to ask all of you to introduce yourself briefly, talk about how you started your business, how fully formed the idea was when you started, and how would that change if you were to start your business again today in this economic environment? And uh, we'll start with Jamie. Good evening, and thank you again, Vincent, for the intro. Uh, my name is Jamie Stevens. I'm a partner at the law firm Loberg Stevens here in downtown Chicago. I started the business with my partner, Brad Loberg. I guess it was about seven months ago. He had had a practice of his own, and I'd come out of a litigation firm to join him. The business idea of starting a law firm for me was something I'd been working on for about the previous two to three years, looking at the legal market, looking at what I wanted to do personally in my practice and professionally as an attorney, the idea of having a firm where I could direct what was going on, get a feel for how I wanted to structure the practice and improve upon the normal business model. So I started doing the homework, learning everything I could about the practice and the management of the practice so that down the line when I was ready to do so, I would have that plan in play. Looking back at starting what we did recently, there's a lot of learning that you can't ever plan for. There are a lot of pieces of information that are part of the puzzle you don't even know exists. If you think about a big aquarium puzzle, you know to put together three of the fish, but you don't see the sharks, you don't see the coral. There are lots of unknowns that you have to account for. And knowing what I know now, I probably would have taken a crash course in accounting, probably would have taken a crash course in you know, structuring the finance of an organization based upon a monthly booking system, but also I think I had a decent preparation for going out and getting a feel for what I knew about the market, what I knew about the business model and the product, and how to price it competitively. Hello, everyone. I'm Dorte Royal Hatinger, and um, I've been in the entertainment industry since I was um, a child. I was an actress, and I did a lot of voiceover work. And so by the time I got to college, um, I knew that I was passionate about the power of media to change the way people think and live. Um, but I knew that I wanted to um, have more creative control and also get behind the camera. Um, and so I started um, doing work in documentary film and public television. And um, being a member of what people now call the social networking generation, um, I realized that as amazing as many um, documentary films are, they don't get seen by the majority of people. And it's hard to kind of get access to that great art. And so for me, um, it made sense to start a web video production company. Um, to really try to get that type of content out to people throughout the country, throughout the world, for free, online. And of course, you're all probably wondering, well, how on earth could anyone make money doing that? And that's still actually um, something that people in this industry are trying to figure out. Um, and there are a lot of different models that are in place, including advertising and getting your content distributed on bigger networks. Um, but yeah, that's kind of all I have to share right now. <laughs> Um, my name's David Chung. Uh, Vincent said that um, if we wanted to, we could go on at length a little bit, right? Um, and I probably um, will do that. I've got uh, two companies that uh, I guess are noteworthy enough to talk about here. Uh, my first company, well, let me back up a little bit. Um, I went to the UFC and dropped out of the UFC. Um, I went there for a couple of years and uh, was studying economics, pre-med, something like that. And um, uh, left to write a screenplay. I was one of the founding members of uh, uh, Off Off Campus. So um, left to write a screenplay because I thought I could do it. Um, and a few years after I did that, I started to run out of money. Um, after thinking about it, I thought, well, I just need to figure out a way to make some money so I could keep writing my screenplay. So a friend of mine came uh, to Chicago 
uh, from the West Coast, and he brought this little bottle of juice called Adwala. And uh, I tasted it, and I asked where I could get it here because it was really good. It was a, a fresh juice and smoothie product that you see around town now. Um, I couldn't find it anywhere. So I uh, immediately thought to myself, hey, if I make the juice, I'll make some money. So I started, uh, I collected some people, um, and so that's a longer story than this, but I collected some people, and we formed a partner group, and we raised a million dollars in capital and started a company called Fantasia Fresh Juice. Um, you now know Fantasia as Naked Juices. Um, they bought us in 2002. So we went from zero to, I think, a $15 million company in three years. So it was, a, it was the fastest non-tech company during that period, growing uh, during that period in time. Um, now what I do is um, uh, I started another company called I Wish. And what I Wish does is uh, we teach private lessons. So if you want to learn something like piano, guitar, painting, Spanish, cooking, anything that's generally hobby-oriented, you contact us, uh, tell us the time and place that you want the lesson. Uh, we'll send you a teacher with all the materials. So we teach people all around Chicagoland. Uh, we have fully integrated programs with uh, corporations here in Chicago. Um, and we also have something, and I'm, I'm saying this because I want you all to come, uh, called the World Food Tour. And what that is is that we uh, teach cuisine and culture classes in uh, ethnic restaurants all over Chicago. So you get to visit the ethnic restaurants. You get to try the food. Um, it's just 20 bucks. And um, you get to learn more about I Wish. And we teach you about the cuisine and culture. So we're doing this all around the city. Um, and it's really rocketing our company uh, during this, this bizarre economic climate. So we're actually doing very well. And there's reasons to that, which I can get into later, um, why this is working so well in this, in, in this climate. So that's my story. Uh, testing, great. Uh, my name is Charles Stevenson, um, and uh, I won't uh, be quite as long as David, perhaps, but I will tell you my story. Uh, I attended the University of Chicago uh, and uh, earned my master's degree in international relations in 1991. Uh, at that point, I moved to the Philippines uh, and lived in Manila and taught as an associate professor there, uh, teaching social and economic development theory, as well as U.S. diplomatic relations with Southeast Asia. Uh, after spending about four years there, I came back to the university uh, to continue my doctorate work in history, uh, and like David, decided that dropping out might be the best course of action. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I did that and uh, quickly gathered some really talented friends of mine who I'd met through the university and uh, through networking. And uh, we started back in 1995 an internet company uh, when the whole thing was just getting started. Uh, we decided that the, the, the proper venue for us was web development, making websites for companies and individuals and startups. Uh, we did that for about uh, six years, and we eventually sold the concern to a, uh, an internet um, uh, incubator company called Divine Interventures, uh, run by Andrew Filipowski. You may have heard of him around here. Uh, uh, after that venture, um, we left the organization, started another venture, and I'm proud to say we failed terribly. <laughs> uh, and uh, we learned a lot from that failure, and uh, it was an important part of my uh, professional development. Uh, uh, following that, we started another web development company called Billups Design, and that is the company that we're growing and building today. Um, in the course of growing this company, uh, we service clients uh, all over the city and all over the country, uh, Hyatt International, uh, Nike, Adidas, um, uh, Mark Shale Clothiers, which is a signature Chicago company, and, uh, and some other large accounts like Motorola and General Electric. Uh, in our off time, we decided to build some software tools that would help other web development companies like ourselves save money and be more effective at what they do. So we developed a tool that allows uh, developers to compare the websites they build in different browsers on a single screen. So you can dial up uh, IE7, and you can dial up Safari, and you can see your site in both of those browsers on a single screen at your desk. And it goes much, much deeper than that, but that's the general gist of it. Uh, about 14 months ago, we sold that piece of software to Adobe Systems in San Francisco. And uh, in about a month, it's going to be introduced as part of the Creative Suite 4. Uh, that Adobe has been selling this year. So we're very, very excited about that. And we actually are more excited by the idea that we may be making a better World Wide Web. 
uh, because we believe that with this tool, developers can make better sites that people can access more uh, easily, uh, more dependably, and more consistently. So uh, you know, we're real excited about this tool, and we hope that anyone who's doing development uses it. Uh, that's really about it. We have uh, 12 employees now. Um, we're continuing to uh, expand into social media consulting, uh, as well as the usual services associated with web development for commercial enterprises. And uh, 2010 looks like a very good year for us. Um, I'm hoping that's the case for everybody. So uh, we are optimistic about next year, how things are shaping up. That's it. Hi, I'm, I'm Andy Cleavorn, and um, I'm a lawyer. Um, up until 2000, I was a partner in the law firm of Sidley and Austin, which is a major law firm, international law firm, really. Uh, it today has about 2,000 lawyers. Um, one of the reasons that motivated me to help form a new law firm was some of my partners and I decided that, um, when we were at Sidley, decided that the model of the large law firm didn't necessarily seem to be workable or sustainable over the long term. It was high cost. As anybody who's used a major law firm knows, they're rather expensive. Um, today, probably the average hourly rate is somewhere in the neighborhood of five to six hundred dollars an hour for a partner. Um, and they were loading up with costs, high cost litigation associates, for example, high cost rents. And I think we've seen over the past 18 months that our view of where major law firms were was correct, that the cost structures that they had created were not sustainable over the long term, and that all it took was a downturn for those models to be demonstra demonstrably uh, unworkable. So we thought that if we went off on our own, started our own law firm, one of the things we could probably do was deliver legal services in a more effective and efficient way while still making a reasonable living. And that's what we've done. Um, we've been around for 10 years now, and I'm proud to say that we are continuing to grow. When we first started, we had four lawyers. I think we're up to 35 now. And we expect to be able to grow, probably not at that same rate of growth, but uh, something that uh, will allow us to be sustainable for the long term. One of the things I must say that's most um, um, beneficial about starting your own business is you really are in control. That has its good points, I suppose which is you're in control. It's bad points is you're in control, which means any decisions that are made are really, you have to look to yourself if there are bad decisions. So you're responsible for it. Um, uh, one of the things I would say that's beneficial about it though is you get to create the culture in your workplace. So if you wanna make it someplace where it's uh, very nice to have a good healthcare system for your employees, you can do that. If you feel that flexible working hours are something that would be uh, attractive to your employees, you can do that too. We've tried to do all of those things to make it a friendly place to work for people uh, without rigid structures to it. Um, and those are all great things. Uh, on the other hand, I would say that if you're gonna start a business, it's really critical to do two things. It's, it's critical to have a plan, to lay out what your strategy is gonna be, that doesn't necessarily mean that that's the plan that you execute on a daily basis because circumstances change. Nobody has 100% vision or uh, accurate vision as to where things are gonna go. So while you need to plan, you need to be flexible at the same time. Uh, I would say in response to your question, Vincent, about how would, I, how would things be different today if I were to start my business than they were in 2000, the obviously biggest difference is credit's not available. When we started up, we uh, went to a bank and got a line of credit, which helped us to build out office space and uh, start up the facilities that we needed to have a presentable face to clients. Today, I think we'd be, uh, it would be a much more difficult time to be able to do that. 2000, as you may recall, was really the peak of the internet bubble, and money was really quite liquid. Uh, it's not so much today. And so I think that only underscores the need to have a very systematic business plan so that you can go to a bank and say, here's where we're gonna get our revenue from, here's gonna be our expenses, and here's when we expect to earn a profit so that you, Mr. Bank or Mrs. Bank, can uh, expect to get a return on your payment. Without a plan like that today, you're not gonna get money from a bank. And if you need a loan to start a company, and most people do, um, 
uh, you're not going to be able to do that unless you have a very sophisticated, very well thought out plan ahead. So I, it's been gratifying uh, to start a business. It's a challenge every day, uh, and it's something that um, I, I would encourage anybody who's thinking about it to think long and hard about so that you do have good plans and you can execute it on a, on a regular basis. So I just have one more question, and then I'll open up the questions to the audience. So when talking about plans, when you were starting out, how did you prepare financially and emotionally to, to start your own business, and how, did, how would that change today in this environment with, like, nobody has savings anymore? I'll grab that one. Well, I think uh, unlike many people planning to go into business for themselves, I really didn't have the benefit of a lot of personal savings to back that business. We put ourselves in a position where it was going to be sink or swim very, very quickly, and we were fortunate enough to swim. If you're not going into it with a lot of funding behind you, you have to get clients, you have to get your product to market very, very quickly. For us, that's legal services, which is a bit more easy to get out to market than, say, a product that has to go through R&D, development, test runs, and so forth. Um, you know, knowing what I know now, it really isn't that difficult to start something now because the economy doesn't require the same amount of startup capital. Where it used to take, you know, tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of dollars to open a law firm, build out office space, you know, even a phone system could have cost you ten or fifteen thousand dollars during the boom times. Now that all of these businesses are contracting and they're reducing in size, the market is wide open to pick up on the infrastructure of your predecessors. So for us, we were able to, on a very limited capital contribution startup wise, to go and create what would be a standard law firm uh, for a much lower cost. Now, in terms of taking the plunge emotionally, you really just have to walk right out there and do it. Um, you know, my partner was needling me constantly saying, OK, it's time to start the business. Leave your other employer. Get going. It's time to go. You really have to be just ready to take that jump. As soon as you feel like you have a good sense of who you want to be as a business owner and what you want to do, and you can see it coming to fruition, make the leap. Uh, you'll always regret taking it too soon or too late. You'll always step out there at just the wrong time. But it's worth going for it and giving it a shot because you know, as soon as you get into it, you won't regret doing it. It's, it's really been one of the most gratifying feelings to say, yes, I did take that leap. I may have done it too early. I may have done it too late. It takes a lot of gumption and, frankly, a good measure of stupidity to go out there and do it because there's a lot of risk. But you know, it's, it's not something I would ever look back and ever change or do differently. It's really the thrill makes it, the excitement makes it, but, you know, go ahead and do it. If you're ready, take the plunge. Those are great points. I definitely would echo that. It's certainly a roller coaster, but it's a really fun one. Um, for me, um, I, I took about five, I was um, employed as a new media strategist at C3 Communications here in Chicago doing um, online outreach and web video for nonprofits. Um, so I was already um, pretty much employed within um, the type of industry that I was looking to um, start my own business in. Um, but it took me about five months of thinking about this idea before I actually made a move. And um, I, I definitely would emphasize that don't uh, underestimate um, how much time and how much creative power and thinking needs to go into something like this. People see you have an idea and execute it. They don't know the sleepless nights and the months and months that you've been just thinking about taking that first step. And so I think that's a really critical time. And I definitely give yourself that luxury if you can. Um, a couple tips that I, I just wrote down briefly before I came in questions to ask yourself as you're approaching this idea of starting your own business is, you know, do I have a good network that I've built up um, in my industry or in the industry that I'd like to enter? Um, I found that the people that I had been working with for the past couple of years were absolutely, you know, integral to my success and um, were kind of already tapped into what I was doing. And so once I started this new venture, they were like, okay, great, let's help spread the word about Dorte's new thing. Um, the other question I would say is, are you willing to take a risk? Um, there's definitely a lot of security that you give up, um, but 
what you lose in security, you gain in flexibility. And hopefully, you know, if things work out, you'll also get more security. Um, but it's, yeah, especially in the entertainment industry, which I don't know how many people are interested in, but it's, um, it's very intense. Um, so, yeah, things I would do differently. I, I don't know, you know, if, if I were to go back and tell myself how difficult it would be, I probably, <laughs> I probably would have done it anyway, but um, just be prepared. And, you know, if for me, an entrepreneur is someone who has this nagging idea that just won't go away, and one day they just decide to act on it. And for me, it was just I had this idea. I needed to be on the road talking to farmers and urban gardeners and spreading the word online. And I just I couldn't stop thinking about it. So I was like, fine, we'll just do it no matter what. Great. <laughs> Um, I don't, I, I'm curious as to what Charles would say. Uh, and I am the too. answer, yeah. I'm very curious. Um, I, I I think the thing that um, I, I I've got I got the I, I, uh, unique perspective sharing with Charles of having uh, developed multiple companies and and these two companies completely different. Um, Fantasia, the first company, uh, we knew exactly what we were doing. Uh, we um, reverse engineered Adwala essentially. And we diagnosed every aspect of that company, and we knew how to rebuild it. That was the whole plan. Understand how uh, all its components, and then rebuild it uh, uh, in maybe, hopefully, a little better way. Um, we knew how much capital we needed to raise, um, and we just we started to raise that money through networking. And we raised a million dollars um, when we raised capital. We actually had to raise it twice. We raised it once. There was an E. coli breakout that happened. We lost the million dollars that Adwala had an E. coli problem. We lost a million dollars, and we had to re-raise it with a whole different group of investors. So um, with um, I wish, um, I went into it with a really cocky attitude. Uh, I'd done it once. I thought, how easy would it be to do it again? Um, the plan there was to raise three to four million dollars. This was during the dot-com boom. Um, on paper, just the idea itself was being valued at $20, $30 million just on paper. It was an insane time. And um, we had gotten half a million dollars into our fundraising, and then everything popped. 9-11 happened. There was the bubble burst, and all of our funding dried up. And we had to make a decision whether or not to go forward or, uh, with the idea of the company. Um, I had the idea for a very long time, so I was determined to keep going forward. But it's you know, it was a hard road to, to recover from that. Um, whatever plans that we had made and created from the three to five million dollars that we were going to raise, um, I had financial models and operational models that were 100 gigs large, and, you know, uh, we, we were as prepared as we could be, were thrown out the window because all of the, uh, the math was different. Um, and so we had to sh start all over again uh, from a shoestring budget. Um, and I think, I think what, what, what he said is exactly right, that in this economy, it really is a lot easier to, to start a company. It's actually very interesting. I never really thought about it that way. Everything is, is cheaper. Um, everything is cheaper to buy. Everything is cheaper to... So if you can pull together um, some capital... And if you have an idea that you really think, and, and my specialty is, is retail, um, it's consumer retail. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm really not good on the B2B side. But if you have a, a retail idea that you really think is going to uh, uh, sell in, in the marketplace, then um, now is, is actually a, a pretty good, good time to do it. Um, emotionally, uh, yeah, you just got to kind of take a leap of faith. I, I, I think that's right. Um, again, if, if you believe in your idea, there's no perfect time to do it. You're always going to have regrets. I think that was ac very accurate, too. Um, but uh, you need to have a passion and belief in your product. I, you hear this all the time. from I, what, you, know, you see entrepreneurs on TV and stuff, and they say the same thing over and over again. But if you understand why it's true, then you get it. If you understand why it's so important to believe in your product, be passionate about your product, then you actually understand why you need to, you need to do it. And, and I think that there's also an art to it all. Um, the art for me is, is you're creating something that wasn't there before. And, and that's what's, for me at least, so unbelievable. There's a juice product out there that wasn't there before. My, my, 
one of my fondest memories of, of Fantasia is the first time I saw a bottle of Fantasia fr uh, fruit juice uh, as litter on the ground, an empty bottle. And I thought, oh my god, we made it. There's my bottle next to the Coke can, you know, and, and it was a wonderful thing. And right now, I know that there are lessons being taught in Chicago um, as I sit here and speak to, to all of you. And, and these things are happening, and, you know, yesterday they weren't happening. Uh, that, that's, that's what's amazing to me. Um, in my experience, I, I tend to agree with the other panelists uh, as far as is this a good time to start a company. Um, I really believe, and, and my partner has believed for about the last 17 months, that this is a, a unique situation for us in our industry. Uh, we provide web services and consulting. Uh, so what we found starting to happen at our agency was that all the best talent in the industry were losing their jobs. They were on the sidewalks, and for the first time in our company's history, they were calling us and asking for positions, asking how they could lend their talents and their experience to our agency, and they were asking for less than they were asking for in remuneration even a year earlier. So that was really important to us, and, uh, and it's meant a lot in our growth in the last 17 months, and it's given us a competitive advantage that we didn't have before the downturn in the economy. The other thing that's a huge opportunity for us is that client relationships with these other agencies that we compete with have broken down. Uh, many of them have either, the agencies have either closed their doors or scaled back or let go of certain talent. And so those relationships with their clients are in flux. And we see those opportunities and we reach out to those people. So we've able, been able to create a much larger network of clients in the Fortune 500, the Fortune 1000, simply because of the disturbance under the surface that's been created by the economic situation today. So I agree with all of you that this is a good time to consider starting um, for our unique reasons. Uh, the second thing I wanted to point out was that um, a lot of people who begin to think about becoming an entrepreneur tend to confuse it with achieving personal wealth. Um, yes, that happens uh, with people who are successful at it, um, but that's the end of the road. Uh, entrepreneurship, uh, at least in my experience, has been about creating sustainability, um, creating uh, jobs for people, people with families, um, and supporting those people uh, through the activities of the organization. Uh, and, and that's really important to us. And even if we only made enough money uh, to take home and you know, keep the kids in school, pay the bills, and things like that, the company is strong, the company has a solid foundation, and we're growing our role of talent. Um, so the future always looks brighter for us. But you know, we're really careful not to confuse our entrepreneurial drive with the idea that um, we're simply doing this to achieve personal wealth. Um, that will take care of itself in time, uh, if indeed uh, it's destined to be. And the last thing I wanted to point out, at least on this particular question, uh, you asked, you know, what kind of emotional uh, or financial, you know, preparations should you make before this? In our case, financially, we're a bootstrap organization. We've never tried to go out and raise money. Um, we felt uh, deliberately so very early on uh, that in our industry, which is, again, web consulting and web services, uh, we didn't have a distribution network to fill out. We didn't have to create a huge roster of talent uh, and other individuals to make the organization work and get the product to market. What we had to do was assemble a tight core of people who were located in a market that had a lot of opportunities um, and then go forward from there. So we actually funded our own growth in every company that I've started. There's freedom in that, there's limitation in that. Um, but uh, that's a choice that all entrepreneurs, when they start out, have to make for themselves based on the kind of company they want to create. Emotionally, what I love about being an entrepreneur, and I've always loved it, uh, is that it is like running a war. Uh, it's a bit of a cliche, but it's true. Um, every day that you wake up, there are 17 different battles raging around you. There are human resources issues. There are uh, uh, talent depletion issues. There are clients who may have a problem this week. And then you've got all kinds of other myriad of, of, of things going on in your company. And, and like you said, you know, we're responsible for those when you're the owner of that company and you're the entrepreneur. But it is exhilarating. And it's exhausting at the same time. But I think that that's one of the most appealing things about this to me. As a professor and as a graduate student, and that's the extent of my other experience in life, um, I always thought, you know, while I'm doing these things, there's always a monkey on my back. And if I just leave graduate school at the University of Chicago, that monkey will go away. 
It never went away. I have two monkeys on my back now, and, and I live with them every day of my life, but uh, I really, really enjoy um, the flux, the uncertainty, um, and the control that you have over this, and the fact that no day is like the day before. Um, and that's one of the most appealing things about entrepreneurship in, in my limited experience. I'd ag I would agree with what's already been said uh, in whole. Um, the one thing I would add is that two things, really. Uh, financially, I think becoming a startup business, which is what we basically did, it's kind of like investing in the stock market. You ought not invest any money in the stock market unless you're really willing to lose it all. And you ought not start a business unless you're willing to recognize that you might fail. And as a result, you ought to be able to plan in the event of failure. Not that you're looking forward to failure or that you expect failure, but you have to grasp the possibility that you might fail. Because if you don't, you're not planning properly because you need to have a best case, a medium case, and a worst case. And your worst case is probably failing. So you need to prepare for that both financially and emotionally. Second aspect I'd say is to the extent that um, you are in a large organization, one of the big emotional changes you're going to face is your identity, to a certain extent, was wrapped up with the identity of that organization. If you have a name brand law firm that you work for, it's nice to go into court and say, I'm a partner at name brand law firm. When you start up a law firm, you no longer get to go in and say, I'm a partner at name brand law firm, who a judge will automatically recognize as being a law firm of highly qualified lawyers. You've got to build your reputation now. And that can be a big change for people. It was a big uh, change that I had to make. Uh, when I went into court and I'd say who I was with and what law firm I was with, people automatically could associate certain things with me. Well, they couldn't now because I'd go in and it'd be some name that people hadn't heard before. Uh, and uh, only by making my reputation would judges and clients be able to start recognizing that. That's a huge emotional change, and I didn't expect it, um, but to the extent you are with an organization that does have a name brand attached to it, that's something that you will have to adjust to. Uh, finally, to the extent that any of you uh, have family, spouses, children, you have to prepare them for the changes that are going to occur in your life as well. To a certain extent, you become consumed with the organism that is your new enterprise. And that can be distracting to your emotional attachment to your wife and children. Uh, and so you need to all go in it together and to say, this is going to be a big change in our lives. I'm hopeful that we'll all be able to adjust to it. Uh, and if you don't do that, chances are one or more of your significant others is going to be disappointed or reflect some sort of disappointment in the way their life is going. Whereas if you get buy-in from the front, I think that mitigates the possibility of those sorts of disappointments. There will be a lot of opportunities for all of you guys, and I'd like to open up for questions. Who wants to start? The gentleman on the left. And so to rephrase the question for the benefit of the people who are looking on the website, um, the question is to Charles about the good talents we can get right now and how you can keep up with it when the market gets better. Um, I think that that's kind of a, a multi-pronged answer, um, and you kind of do it through a lot of different techniques. Uh, the first one is we try to create uh, a culture at our company um, that is very conducive to professional and personal growth. Um, we like to create an atmosphere where people collaborate together and uh, and work as units. Um, so. You know, we, we try to make it so that it's difficult for them to reconsider joining a larger agency after they've been with us for a while. And we also give them an opportunity to control some of the outcomes at our agency, um, something that they may have had more limited access to at the larger agencies. Um, and then we kind of start infecting them with the entrepreneurial spirit. Um, and they themselves begin to identify themselves as uh, top-notch talent with agency experience, but they're in a new place that has a growth curve that's much higher than, say, an established agency where they can really control the outcome with the ownership um, and reap the rewards of it. So that's my answer. Does it always work? No. 
do we lose some people back when the economy turns around and they want to go to a much larger agency? Yeah, that can happen. Um, and then we simply, you know, go back into the job pool and we start looking for new talent. So, you know, uh, we try to keep turnover really low, but it's, it's unavoidable in some cases. Would anybody else like to follow up? I, I think what we do is we, we pre-screen for the things that Charles just mentioned. Uh, we, we look for that entrepreneurial spirit up front. Um, we look for people who, I, it's a little odd to say, but you know, you, can, you know that you can take advantage of that uh, because they want to be um, a part of an organization that's like that. If you, if you do that successfully, if you develop a system where you can identify those people and, and tap into that, then you can keep people for a long time and, and adjust to, to, to market changes like you're talking about. And the gentleman on the right, your question? Um, we brought in a, a top salesperson on the partner level for, um, uh, for Fantasia. So we made them a partner. Um, it was a, a, what you considered a critical component. I, it's smart to understand what your core competencies are going to need to be and then bring those people in at, at a top level where they're invested. Um, and this is where um, attorneys become really helpful because you need to protect yourself from, from um, you know, things that can go wrong. But if you can successfully navigate that, then that's going to uh, start you off with a really, you know, it's a strong team. You're like the New York Yankees, right? Um, with, uh, with I wish it was a little different. Um, with I wish, um, we didn't, I wish, I wish is interesting because I wish is not, has never been done before. It's a company that you don't, that doesn't exist uh, anywhere. So we're figuring it out as we go along. So we're bringing in the pieces uh, the people, business development people, as we understand that we need them. So, so there's two different ways, you know, the, the approaches that I've taken. But yeah, I, if you if you know what your core competencies need to be, get them. And the gentleman up front. What is your revenue model for I wish? Yeah. Uh, we essentially it's it's similar to 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 hers, which is we we want to bring in people to the website. So the World Food Tour, I mean, I kind of brought it up flippantly before, uh, but it's actually a critical component to our, our marketing. Um, we, by teaching all of these classes in all of these restaurants, and we don't make money off of these classes, but what we do is we bring attention to our brand, and we're able to, in an intimate way, just like I'm talking to you here, we can talk to the people in these restaurants, uh, these students, right, um, uh, and, and, and ask them to come to our website. They come to our website, and then we sell other things. We sell private lessons. We sell uh, private events. Um, you know, and it gives us a platform to, to sell just about anything that we want to sell. And our kind of boundary line would be any, we don't want to sell anything that changes our brand image. So you know, we, can, we can sell anything that has to do with learning. So that question was to David about his revenue model. Would anybody else like to follow up? I'll, I'll just say one thing. Uh, at our agency, we initially focused on what we were really best at, and that was a variety of web services. And it was a single revenue stream, and it came from our clients. And we were tied to how many hours we could work, you know, was, was tied to how much revenue we could make with those clients. And then we had to expand the model out with people in order to make those revenues go up. And I think that everyone who starts a company should really understand their one single revenue model that they believe is going to fund their company and its operations. However, as we've grown and become more experienced, we've learned there are multiple revenue streams that we can create inside of our agency. And we kind of work to create um, a balance among those revenue streams so that we can dedicate our time and resources to the ones that make the most sense. And then some of the other revenue streams kind of work for us. Um, and I think that as an entrepreneur, you don't want to try to do that you know, initially. You don't know your business well enough yet. You don't know your industry well enough yet. But as you move along, you should always be exploring ways to multiply your revenue streams and, and have them kind of work on autopilot as much as you can do it. So you can focus on what you like to do the most and your single revenue stream. The question is about using entrepreneurship to create work for yourself and the using of your networking and social skills and, and to change your career. Um, for me, again, with the whole social networking um, generation perspective here, but um, uh, what I've noticed, um, a great tool to use is if you're looking to enter a new industry or become an expert in something 
or start a business um, in a very specific um, niche to start a website or start a blog and begin to position yourself as that expert. I mean, I think that's the beauty of um, the social networking age and social media is that it's free, basically, to position yourself as an expert and to put yourself out there. I mean, we started OrganicNation.tv with, I want to say, less than $3,000. And, you know, within three months, you know, we had major press writing about us. We had, you know, thousands of views per month and just, you know, kind of remarkable success. And it was actually only two people running the entire enterprise, but people around the world were watching our videos and, um, you know, when I would talk to people, they're like, wow, you know, how many people do you have on staff? I'm like, two, but we just know how to use the tools that are there to make us look huge and just to disperse it everywhere. And so I would definitely take advantage of those tools. Um, in addition to, you know, attending the conferences and events and going to, you know, the Chicago chapter of whatever it is that, you know, I, I did a lot with, you know, Chicago social media, Chicago bloggers, Chicago this, Chicago that. So um, I, I, I highly recommend all those tools. I'm going to actually jump in on that one right quickly. Yeah, it, <clears throat> part of what you might find when you're deciding to take the entrepreneurial course is that something you're doing might lead to something else that could be just as profitable or more fun. So in that sense, you might find a career changer through that. With our firm now, I'm working with one of our of counsels to develop a new corporation to fill a niche that through her specific business knowledge she knew of and knew due to certain market conditions and other factors would be ripe for the taking, that there was going to be this big market share open that needed to be seized and developed. So in that sense, you know, though we have a law firm going, there's also this other project coming through. And a lot of it is once you decide to take the plunge, uh, it's not uncommon that you'll want to start another business in the sense that you'll understand that the tools that you've, that you've used and the things you've learned in creating one change or one new opportunity actually give you points of innovation and thought for doing something different and or better. So it's developing your skill set, first of all, to start the business, developing your skills to know how to time, how to essentially position a business to be profitable and successful in that market, and then you'll start to see other opportunities out there where you can pick up areas where a small bit of innovation maybe restructuring the price on something or improving the development of a product or the implementation of a product would actually lead to another profitable venture. The key then, of course, is owning the venture and having it staffed. So if you're running these three other four things going on, making sure that you know what type of a team you could plug in to develop that new venture over time. Any other question? So the question was, how to choose your partner in terms of starting your business? I'll, I'll answer first. Um, I've had four businesses, and I've had uh, one singular partner through all four businesses and a few other ones. Um, it happened organically. Uh, we were friends first. Um, we shared uh, similar uh, interests, uh, similar curiosities, um, and we both saw the opportunity of this thing called the Internet back in 1995. Um, I was fortunate, um, but the only thing I would say to anyone who's considering who do I choose and how do I choose them is don't manufacture it. Um, maybe in your all's experience, manufacturing a business partner through recruiting um, or through you know, calling up someone in your network and saying, I think that together we can do this, um, has its perils uh, down the road. Um, you just never can be quite sure if you're meshing on an intellectual and a personality level as well as a business acumen level. Um, so organically usually works the best, um, at least it has in my case. Um, I would also say that if you're thinking of starting a company, think seriously about getting a partner. Um, even if you feel like, you know, I can kind of run this at first. It's going to be small. I'll do this myself. More money for me. Um, you will drown. You, sorry, you need another person's uh, head, another person's thinking and their perspective uh, to bounce your ideas off of, to weigh the risks and the benefits of decisions that you make. And I, I think a partner is just indispensable, at least in my experience. Um, all right. I have the absolute opposite answer. To that. Um, I've had like a billion partners, um, and some of them worked, some of them didn't work. Uh, I, some of them were friends at first, um, and some of them uh, we recruited um, on some level. Uh, and I'm now of the opinion that you, you just get lucky or you don't. Um, 
One way to look at it, though, that is, I think, a little bit measurable is that partners ha even partners can have shelf lives. Um, I, th I think Charles might be lucky in, in finding that one person, but I haven't been so lucky. Um, and you can take a look at your partner group or a partner um, and, and try to estimate, you know, how long is this going to last, um, or at least understand that it's not a permanent thing. And I think if you go in it with that kind of mentality, then, um, and, and your partner go in it with that kind of mentality too, then you can form a relationship with agreements um, that, that will work uh, for your company and not, and not against it. So. Andy, would you like to follow up? Yeah. Um, my partners today were my partners when I founded the law firm. We were all partners together. But, you know, we were four of 1,500 partners or something, so we had to choose how we were going to decide to form this enterprise. And I'd say the two critical attributes that I think in a partner that you need are, one, you have to be able to be brutally honest with one another, uh, and second, you can't carry grudges against one another because there's nothing more deleterious towards a successful enterprise and two people getting diverted off of personal issues. So those are the two things I think you've got to look for. Uh, you need to be able to talk about those things before you even form the partnership, which means you've got to be able to criticize somebody and say, these are the things that I find less than satisfactory about you. Um, and are you willing to do things that I would find appropriate? And they need to be able to say the same thing to you and you can't then go forward without trying to fix those things. Um, so I think it's like a marriage in a lot of respects. If you can't have a good knock down, drag out fight with one another without letting it cause disruption to your marriage, you're probably not gonna make a good partner with one another. And so Andy, to follow up in your marriage metaphor, how long should you be dating before you get married? <laughs> Well, I had dated with my partners for a good 10 years, so uh, I was very comfortable that I was going to be able to work with them. I think it would be very difficult. Um, I have never did it, but it would be very difficult to start off with somebody who I didn't know for more than a year or so to be able to have that sort of relationship with one another. Yeah. I, part of this is, is why you're bringing in a partner, a particular partner at a particular time. If you're bringing in a partner to help you create or further develop the vision of the company. They're right there at the beginning. You're sitting in your living room or your basement, and you're just talking. That person needs to be, you know, uh, marriage material, I suppose. Um, uh, then, then there's a different kind of partner where, where they're functional. Um, and I think our, our salesperson, our business, business development person um, at Fantasia, um, I mean, he's a great guy and everything, but we needed, a, we needed an expert salesperson. Right, um, and so it was a lot easier to, you know, it's, it's slots and tabs. You know, you can just kind of integrate that in, um, and and that might have been because it was a more functional relationship. Um, we didn't have to have such a deep, you know, knowledge of each other. So I, there's there's levels too. Dorothy, would you like to follow? I would love to just add that <clears throat> for anyone who's thinking about starting a company with their best friend. Um, especially if you're a little more inexperienced, um, I would recommend absolutely laying out expectations, um, figure out your titles, figure out what those titles mean, figure out how much of the company you feel that each other owns, um, because down the line, no matter if this is your best friend in the entire world, as soon as money starts to come in or money becomes an issue, things get a little crazy. <laughs> Um, I've been lucky enough to start um, Organic Nation with my also partner in life, Mark Boyer, and I have to say, I mean, it is in a way like a marriage, and it's incredibly important to have someone that you trust and who can, you know, definitely be honest with you about, you know, when you're, <laughs> when you're getting off track. Um, but I definitely recommend it. Another question. The question is, how did you learn to be an entrepreneur? And once it's growing, what did you do with it? And how do you know what to do? Um, the, I'm sorry, what was the first question? <laughs> how did you learn how to be an entrepreneur? Right. Um, 
I think my entrepreneurial background happened to come from organization building. So when I was at, at the UFC, um, uh, I kept on making clubs, you know. Um, I mean, Off Off Campus was one of them. There was um, and a handful of other clubs. Uh, I think it was later that I discovered that that was somewhat of, that was a, creating organizations was a thrill, and I, thought, I think that turned into um, uh, building companies. Is, is that answering that first question for you a little bit? Yeah. Um, and um, uh, was the second question was, sorry. Once it's growing, how do you know yeah. what to do with it? Yeah, so exit, uh, everyone here is familiar with this, exit strategies, right? That's, that's critical. Um, even if the exit strategy is to not have a real exit strategy, uh, you need to know that. So with Fantasia, we built it to uh, grow for three years and sell, and, and that's exactly what we did. Um, uh, and then with um, I Wish, we're building I Wish to last you know, forever, hopefully. Um, and that's going to kind of drive your planning for the company. Um, you know, that's a tough question. It is a tough question. I'm not yeah. sure what the answer is. Yeah, you, you, um, you're constantly getting feedback from the market. You know what? A company is like any other product out there. I'm going to go to back to my re retail background, right? Um, there's going to be supply and demand for your company. Your company is a product on a, on a grocery shelf, right? Um, if there's a lot of demand for it, the price of that product goes up. If there's hardly any demand for it, the price of that uh, product, you know, it, it, it's just a, it's part of a market mechanism. Um, all, all our companies are valued in a certain way. When there's huge demand for it, you know, you'll, you'll know that. Um, and then you have opportunity. You have opportunity to sell. You have opportunity to grow. You have opportunity to get loans. You have opportunity to get investment money. You have opportunity all over the place. And when you see that opportunity, um, trust me, you'll be uh, compelled to try to figure out which one you should take uh, advantage of and, 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 and go forward with. So that's my best answer. Uh, just one quick thing to add to on you know how do you how do you know when you've got the skills and uh, and the requirements to start an entrepreneurial venture? Um, in my case, if I had waited until I felt qualified, I never would have become one. Uh, it's an on-the-job learning thing. Uh, again, as it was pointed out early on, you don't know what you don't know. All you know is that you think you've got a service or a product or a talent um, that has a marketable uh, quality to it, and and you dive in stupidly, um, and you build people around you that are smart and can keep your head above water and point you in the right directions. Um, but uh, there really is no minimum threshold of, of skills or understanding or, or business experience to, to venture off into this world. You just have to say, I believe in, in what we're offering. And then and you'll learn every day. You'll learn. And uh, all these things will become second nature to you. Uh, in the, uh, you know, for those who are thinking about starting their business, there are some special pieces of knowledge that you probably already have that will be very helpful in creating your entrepreneurial skill set. These are things that you may have done that you don't even know are useful. Um, they're little skills you acquire over time. For us, it was knowing how to do things that we would otherwise pay someone to do in the startup process. How to punch a phone line in, how to run wire, how to build up a website without paying, uh, you know, one of the legal website provider companies to do so is getting experience with doing that. Which you may, there's lots of things you already know how to do, but when you look at the startup process, those oddball skills that could be completely outside of what you're going to do for your business are going to help because they're going to save you a lot of money and allow you to step into the role of the entrepreneur, which is you know, when something's broken, you're fixing it. When someone needs a new product, you're making it. When someone needs a customer service request attended to, you're the one responding to it. That's a lot of uh, you know, what you have to do just to get things rolling. But I guess to pick up on what David said as well, a lot of my entrepreneurial spirit was fostered in college. Uh, working with student organizations at the U of C was where I had actually a testing ground to try out some of these ideas and concepts. I would go in, for example, when I founded Chicago Society with a friend of mine, we took uh, what was the product of World Conference Group putting on large academic functions we took their product, figured out where they were hemorrhaging money, revamped it, repackaged, and resold. I would also then go and, through Model UN, work with the organization when it was in a pretty serious budget crunch to figure out how to pick up funding, figure out how to cut costs where need be, and then redeploy the same product and the same organization with a better management structure and a better cost structure going down the line. So finding a place where you can test out the ideas and especially in some place like the UFC where the environment's very tough and people are very competitive with you, 
you get a chance to learn about how you know, these skills might be useful down the line. And you may find out when you're out there on the market that oftentimes competition may not be as fierce, that the innovations and the thoughts and just the instinctual pieces of information you pick up on when looking at a problem could be very, very different from your competition and actually might be what helps you to make a really successful product. Actually, I just wanted to let you know that I have to stop at about 7.20. Um, I have a finite time window, so I just wanted to let you know. <laughs> I don't so want to get up and walk off the board. And so with that, we're, we're going to close the event. And um, would you have any final words that you would like to share with the audience? You, you know, I, I, my final word is going to be one more answer to that question. The single most helpful thing to me um, in, in, in successfully entrepreneuring um, is uh, not, being able, uh, not being afraid to ask for help. If you're good at asking for, if you grew up, you know, asking your mom for this and asking your dad for this and, and, and you know, borrowing money and doing, you know, doing all of that stuff, you have a decent chance of succeeding as, as an entrepreneur, trust me. <laughs> um, uh, that's critical. It's, it's not just critical because you need to ask people for things, but it's critical because you need to get stuff done that you just don't know how to do or you can't do, and you're fooling yourself if you think that you need to be adept enough, capable enough, and responsible enough to do everything. So being able to ask, if you don't have that skill, get it uh, before you do anything entrepreneurial. I have one last thing to say. I think the goal should not be how much money can I make. I think it should be what kind of life do I want to lead? How much time do I want at home? What type of people do I want to surround myself? What types of things do I want to learn? Do I want to travel? Do I not want to travel? Th being an entrepreneur means creating your life and creating a vision around you. And definitely be bold when you're thinking about that. Money is not everything. <laughs>